Bible, please turn to Proverbs 30, verses 24 to 28. Four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A lizard can be caught with a hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. Amen. Thanks be to God for um, the reading and reflection upon his word this morning. Sometimes I get caught watching the National Geographic channel. I'm a bit sad like that, like a good, a good nature uh, program. Um, and uh, you pick up lots of seemingly useless information, but other uh, bits of fascinating information. I've got some fascinating information for you just now. First of all, I never knew this, but tigers have striped skin as well. I really hope that's true, by the way. <laughs> you can Google it later. If it's wrong, I'm sorry. Tigers have striped skin as well. I never knew that. A grizzly bear, um, its bite is strong enough to break a bowling ball. You know, that's fascinating. It's really handy if you're temping bowling and a grizzly bear breaks in. At Fife Leisure Park, you're like, oh no, I hope it doesn't bite my bowling ball. And then, oh no, it's my good one. Right, this is an absolute classic, right? Otters have pockets to keep stones inside. Little cute otter pockets. Just to keep the wee stones. In case they need to do something with stones. I don't know what they do with the stones. But otter fight. Flamingos are naturally white. It's their diet of shrimp and algae that turns them pink. So if you go off on your holidays and eat a lot of shrimp and algae, come back, <laughs> they're like, wow. <laughs> wow, that's just that. You've had really bad sunburn or you've been eating loads of shrimp and algae. <laughs> All right, and this one is my favorite. Wombat poop is cube-shaped. <laughs> How on earth does that happen? But I checked that one. I actually checked it, but wombat poop is cube-shaped. So there you go. <laughs> but here we're, we're told of, of four small animals. And we're told in these verses that we can learn a lot from these animals. Proverbs 30, verse 24, four things on earth are small, but they are extremely wise. So a funny little kind of nature lesson here in Proverbs 30 can teach us something about wisdom. If you've got a Bible, turn to Proverbs 3. We're told there in verse 13, blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies, nothing you desire can compare with her. Yes, we should seek God with all our heart and our might and our strength. But it's one thing to know about God, to have knowledge about God. People who teach in universities who know this book inside out, in their mind they can tell you um, various lessons of theology, but they don't know the Lord personally. It's one thing to, to have knowledge. It's another thing to have wisdom, which is applied knowledge. It's one thing to know about God in your head. It's another thing to know him in your heart and to have a personal relationship with him. I certainly could testify, and I'm sure if we were all to have an open time of sharing right now, that we could all say that many times we've got it wrong. We've made wrong choices. We've made wrong decisions. 
And if you choose to learn through your mistakes and come to the Word of God, that you can grow in wisdom. We need wisdom. And like we saw in the video, King Solomon, he, he was offered the opportunity to have anything from God, and he asked for, for wisdom. It's so precious, more precious than gold, to have wisdom. We must seek God. We must seek His wisdom in life, in the the day-to-day moments of life, to to consider what does God say? What would God's guidance be to me? What's God's view on this? And as we walk closer with God, as we are men and women of the Spirit of God, as we keep in step with the Spirit of God, we're people of the Word and of the Spirit, there'll be a greater chance that we'll make wiser decisions decisions. So I want to look at these four small animals and see what we can learn to help us grow in in wisdom. First of all, we see regarding ants that wise people invest a lot of energy in preparation and make decisions with the future in mind. We're told verse 25 there in Proverbs 30, ants are creatures of little strength yet they store up their food in the summer. The most common ant in the Middle East is the harvester ant, which doesn't just gather up picnic crumbs, but actually harvests grain off the stalk. Scientists have observed how they divide their labor. One group climbs up the stalk and chews off the grain. One group carries the fallen kernel back to the nest. One group husks the grain One group carries the kernels underground and stacks them neatly. But if it rains, the ants take all their grain out of the nest and lay it out to dry before restacking it below. And they'll travel over 200 yards to collect food. That's more than six miles in people terms just to get ready for winter. The Bible highlights the importance over and over again of preparation. We're told in Luke 12, verse 35, that we're to be dressed ready for service. We're told in 2 Timothy 2, verse 21, we're to be prepared to do any good work. 1 Peter 1, verse 13, challenges us to prepare our minds for action. 1 Peter 3, verse 15, reminds us to always be prepared to share our faith preparation is so so important think about bible characters who had to go through periods of preparation think about moses how he was prepared for 80 years to lead israel out of egypt think about joshua who was prepared for 40 years to take moses place as leader. Even Jesus prepared for 30 years before he started teaching and doing miracles. Spurgeon once said, if he knew he had 25 years to live, he'd spend 20 of it in preparation. Preparation is so important. Seasons of preparation are so, so important. I wonder in your life, what are you doing to prepare for your future? And what is God doing in you to mold you, to shape you, to prepare you for what he has got in store for your future? You think about Moses in those 40 years in the desert. How God used those years to work in him. He had lived before. He had made mistakes. The years that had gone before. But God used those desert years to prepare him to be a great leader. And the work he did 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 in preparation was a work in his character. What is God doing in your heart just now? Are you willing to be teachable, to 
be like soft clay. He's the potter, you're the clay. To have a soft heart. To desire, do you desire that God would be molding you and shaping you? And sometimes God uses circumstances to get our attention. And we realize, you know, how much of pride is in our life. How much of, if it's about me, 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 rather than God or rather than others. He does his best work in the refiner's fire. The good news, as I say often, C.S. Lewis said, the best is yet to come. So be teachable. Be open to what God is doing in your life. Some of those difficult seasons are preparing you for what God's got in store for you. You need to be in the Word. You need to love God, love the Bible. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit. You need to be prepared. To be obedient if God asks us to, to do a work or to share our faith. We don't know what the future holds. But we know who holds the future. Are you preparing? Wise people invest a lot of energy in preparation. Make decisions with the future in mind. But secondly from, from conies. That wise people know and stay close to their source of protection. Look at verse 26. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the crags. The cony is what is known also as a rock badger. A rock badger. I love that. They're smart and they're successful. So think about a rock badger. Straight in my mind, I've got this idea of this little badger with a backpack. Absalom. <laughs> <laughs> down this mountain but they're smart they're really smart and they are successful because they know the principle of protection they live in crags or or cracks of the rocks where predators can't get to them they spend their entire life within 20 yards of their home and when they stray slightly further away they always have one member who stands on guard and alerts the others to danger. And then they all scuttle back to the rock. Do you see the wisdom, what we can learn from the rock badger, from this little creature? They know their limits. They stick close to a home. They never venture too far without someone watching their back. And they know their rocks. They know their rock. They know where to run and where to hide. They know the place of protection. And they know other people in their family have got their back. We've got so much to learn. Even from a coney. Even from a rock badger. You know, the Bible reminds us often that God is our rock. Psalm 62. The Bible reminds us that the devil is a predator seeking to devour us. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. I wonder do we stay close to the source of our protection? Do we run into that strong tower as we saw in that video earlier? The righteous run into it. They're safe. Are we committed to family, to Christian friendships, to, to our local church, people who watch our back, people who support us, people who see if we're straying and, and warn us in Christian love? You know, don't isolate yourself. You're, you're heading down a, a road that's going to cause pain or you're going to end up under attack. You know, just be careful. We need to watch each other's backs. We need to support one another. We need to be there for one another. And praise God, there is a beautiful family here of people who love you, who've got your back, who will watch you, who will look after you. But ultimately, God, the all-seeing, all-wise, awesome God, He has you in His hands. He is your rock. And friends, the more we stray from God, 
from that place of safety and protection, the more we're likely to fall or get ourselves into trouble. You know, the Bible says over and over again that God is our rock. In him we find security. In him we find safety. He cannot be moved. He cannot be shaken. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. From the coney we learn to stay close to the source of our protection. I remember once climbing up in the Angus Glens. And I think it was Meyer it was called. And I think Dreesh were the two Monroes climbed that day. They're the easy ones. I just do the easy ones. And uh, Julian will keep me right if I pronounce them wrong afterwards. <laughs> but um, it was a really calm day. But as the climb went on, it got really, really, really windy. And um, we're looking for a, a place just to kind of just take some, some shelter. Fog started to come in. And I uh, wanted to have a bite for lunch as well. And, and I remember we just found this massive big rock. And we just sat there and we had our lunch. But it didn't feel hardly any, a breeze. And it was blowing all around us, but we were kind of covered by this rock. God is our rock. He's our place of protection. You can find safety there. You can find that, that place of provision, of security, no matter how strong the wind is blowing, no matter how stormy it is all around you, he is your rock. Know your rock. Run to your rock. Stay there. Stay safe. Stay protected. So we learn from the conies to stay close to the source of our protection in the rhythm of our lives through daily devotions let's stay close to the rock and then thirdly from locusts that wise people know the importance of community wise people know the importance of community verse 27 locusts have no king yet they advance together in ranks there are basically two kinds of insects loners and colonists the loners are like spiders which you always find one at a time. How they get into certain places in the house, I don't know, but I'm just glad we live in Scotland. The animals can't kill you. It's great, you know. Generally, anyway. <laughs> Other parts of the world. I remember watching a program um, about the kind of 100 deadliest creatures or something. Uh, I see I don't get out much, but um, <laughs> it's like 75% of them live in Brazil. You take an animal or an insect that, that we have in Scotland, like an ant, a spider, a horsefly, you name it, in Brazil, they're on steroids and they kill you, right? They, they basically just are, the Brazilian version is basically a poisonous version that can possibly kill you. Um, so yeah, got to be careful. Um, but anyway, the colonists are like bees and ants, and they're always together in groups. But locusts are, are both. In good times, locusts are sluggish loners, but in bad times, like when there's a famine, locusts get very active and begin to swarm. And when that happens, they become a force of nature as powerful as a volcano or a hurricane. They can't be stopped. The largest swarm of locusts on record swept Africa in the early 1900s. It was one mile wide, 100 feet thick, and 50 miles long. Experts estimated it had 10 billion insects in it, which means if you could kill 1 million a minute, it would take you a week to get them all. Wow, it's hard enough catching a wee wasp in the house. <laughs> the swarm ate everything in sight, landing on trees in such mass they broke off three-inch limbs just by their weight. Only another force of nature stopped them. Winds blew them out to sea. But even then, they flew for 60 straight hours before dropping exhausted into the water. So small people do big things when they work together. It's one of the lessons of the locusts. We've all heard the cliches, team together, everyone achieves more, or there's no I in team, but together we can make an impact. And you know my heart and 
I know the heart of this church, that God has been working and we, we give God the glory. But as we consider who we are as a local church, as we consider who our God is, Almighty God, and as we look at the need all around us in our city of Dunfermline, the surrounding towns and villages, that we together, in the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, I, but Christ in me, we want to impact them firmly. We want to see men and women, boys and girls, choose to follow Jesus, to be forgiven of their sins, to know that life in all abundance, to know that hope of heaven. We want to see the, the hungry fed. We want to see um, the broken healed. We want to see the captive set free. We want to be faithful to the Jesus manifesto and to be good news in our city. You know, I, I remember just reading not so long ago about um, the people of God in exile. And um, sometimes it feels a bit like that for the church in these days in our nation. We feel a bit in exile. Well, the word came. To, to the people of God. And I just paraphrase just one line from God. Bloom where you are planted. Serve where he has placed you. Do life before a watching world, often a hostile world. And as the spirit of God works through you, you'll be salt, you'll be light. But it's only God who can enable us to make a greater impact on our city. But let's expect him to do it. And we can do it on our own. We need to do it together. The Bible describes, as we know, the church as the body of Christ. If you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, and I want to read verse 12. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, where we're all baptized by one spirit into one body. And then verses 14 to 15. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of of the body. And then verses 25 to 26. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We are the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. And where there is unity, God commands a blessing, as we're told in Psalm 133. We need to work together. Um, we need to be melted together by God's love. We're not frozen together. We should be melted together. We're all different. We've all got different gifts and, and talents and different personalities. And we will at times irritate each other. I'm sorry about that. We need to forgive one another when we let one another down. We need to be gracious with one another. We need to work together. We need to serve together. We're a community. We're a family. We're not lone rangers. Small people can do great things when they work together in community. And I want to encourage you to keep on keeping on I'm amazed at how many people give up their time to serve in this church. I'm amazed at how many people I see doing work that other people don't see very often. Behind the scenes, not doing it for glory, just committed. Are always inspired by the people who arrive at a church and say, you know, can I stack the chairs? Can I do something like clean the center or do a... I work behind the scenes. Can I do something? Just get my hands dirty. As opposed to turning up on day one and saying, can I preach next week? 
just to have that desire just to humbly excel and to be faithful. So thank you. I'm going to take a bit of time holiday for myself. At least some of you will be having holiday too. Some of you had some amazing holidays already. I've heard the stories. Awesome. Um, so it's a holiday from God. But before I go, I just want to say thank you so much. I am so thankful as a pastor to be part of a church where people serve. And I said it before, I'll never ever guilt people into doing stuff. It doesn't work. You get people to do it for a month or two and then... But what I want and my desire for me, for you, is that as we walk with Jesus, that we listen to what he's saying to us. And that when Jesus calls you to something, calls you to a ministry in the life of the church, that he gives you that great vision and passion for it, that you're just obedient to that. That's all I would ask, that you'd say, yes, I will. I'll do that. And when you know God's called you to it, you know that he'll enable you to do it and that you'll be in it for the long term because you're wanting to do what he's asked you to do. But we need to get a good balance in life because we are the church. So when you go and work in the fields, uh, when you go and work in an office or you work from home or, you know, whatever you do, whatever your, your job is, you know, God has placed you there. And he wants you to be salt and light. He wants to bring the values of the kingdom of God to the we're whole life disciples. We should not um, put life into compartments to say, oh, that's my church work. I do Alpha, but I don't share my faith anywhere else. You know, we are, we're striving. We're not perfect. We're striving to be whole life disciples of Jesus wherever we go. And sometimes we'll not get it right. But that's when we come in repentance and say, Lord, it's all for you. You know, soften my heart. Help me. So that's what I would just ask you to be doing, to be praying. Say, God, what are you saying to me just now? It's a dangerous prayer to pray. Because if you pray that and you really want to hear what God's saying, then changes will happen. If you pray and say, God, what are you saying to me just now? Don't like that one. Don't like that one. Don't like I like that one. See, that's the problem with Facebook. Start liking the things you like. You know, often when I've prayed that prayer, the first thing that God says to me, God, what do you want to say to me? He points out an ugly part of my character. He says, I love you, by the way, completely, unconditionally. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to change that in you. I want to change you. Or he'll say, you know, I'm calling you to be involved in that ministry. Well, that involves a lot of time. You know, I've got this to do, I've got that to do. He's calling you to sow into a ministry financially. But how would I afford that? And what would I do? I've got this to pay. I've got a big holiday. I'm going, I'm doing this. All I'm asking you is, as the church family here, as we consider who God is and what he's got in store for us, that you just pray the prayer and really hear it and make time and space in your life to hear it. God, what are you calling me to do? And who are you calling me to be? We're all in this together. You're an incredible um, group of people. I've been so blessed and I'm still so blessed. And I'm looking forward to what God's got in store for us. I've written down here just things that God put in my heart earlier. You know, maybe God is calling you to lay down a grievance. Forgive somebody. Maybe God's calling you to stop gossiping. Maybe God's calling you to become a member of the church. Maybe get baptized. But just ask the question. God will speak to you. If you ask that question with the right heart, God, speak to me. What do you want to tell me today? He'll speak. So from locusts, we know um, the importance of community. And then lastly, lizards. Wise people are persistent we're told, verse 28, a lizard can be caught with a hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. Lizards can be captured easily. Well, the small ones can be. 
And yet, somehow, they can get past the guards to the king's palace. You know, lizards are persistent little creatures. I remember going abroad years ago, and um, no matter how many times you dropped the little geckos out of your room, they always managed to get back in. I don't know how they did it. Uh, <coughs> and it could have been different ones, but either that, they were breathing in the room. Um, but uh, they have a few climbing mechanisms that are interesting. They have claws, which unlike a cat's, are spread apart even when they're relaxed. They have adhesive pads in the middle of their feet that stay slightly moist for added grab. They have scales that catch onto rough surfaces so geckos can easily pull themselves up. Uh, if you catch them and throw them out as often as you like, they'll keep climbing back for more. They're persistent. And the Bible reminds us that if we want to grow in our relationship with God, we need to be persistent. We need to persevere. Sadly, there are so many who give up when the going gets tough. But the Bible reminds us over and over again to have faith and to persevere. There's a great verse. I think it's in Micah. And I can't remember the reference. Though I fall, I will rise again. I love that. Though I fall, I will rise again. We're told in Romans 2 verse 7, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Galatians 6 verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We're told in Hebrews 10 verse 36, you need to persevere. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. God works all things for the good of those who love him. We need to be persistent. We need to not give up. Never, never give up. To persevere, to run that race with perseverance. Now often... In conversation, sometimes from the pulpit, I've warned people regularly about the prosperity gospel. That to follow Jesus doesn't mean that you'll be always healthy and wealthy and life will be always straightforward. We need to develop a theology of suffering, that understands suffering and how God is present in some of the most challenging times of our life. He's got a purpose in it all. You know, Jesus himself, as we know, suffered greatly. He is the crucified God, but God had a purpose in his suffering. God's got a purpose in your suffering. You need to persevere and to trust him and not give up and not isolate yourself and not go off on your own, but keep on keeping on part of a local church, following Christ, trusting that if you listen to him, if you obey him, that he will lead you, that he will bless you, that he's got greater things in store for you. Friends, I'm finishing, but so much more, so much more. Why do we limit him so much? He's got so much more for you. And please keep praying that prayer. God, what do you want to say to me today? Pray in the morning. God, who do you want to, um, me to speak to today? What are the opportunities you're going to give me today? God speak. I will obey. I'll do what you want me to do. So as we finish, I know you're still thinking about those fascinating facts from the beginning. You'll be going home and checking them on Google to make sure that I'm not just making them up. But what wisdom can we learn from these four small animals? Well, from the ants, that wise people invest a lot of energy in preparation. And make decisions with the future in mind. From the conies. That wise people stay close to the source of their protection. From the locusts. Wise people know the importance of community. From the lizards. Wise people are persistent. Let's seek God. Let's seek wisdom from God. Applied knowledge in our lives. And to love God with all our heart, our soul our mind and our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenge of your word, for the power of your word. God, we need your wisdom. 
for daily living. All the different challenges that we face. All the different life situations. Lord, we confess that at times we've, we've got it wrong. We've tried to fix it our way. We've tried to do things our way. Lord, we need divine wisdom from you, the all-knowing God. And help us to be obedient to what you say. Help us really faithfully pray that prayer every day. God, what do you want to do today? What do you want to tell me today? I, I want to hear it, even if it's painful, even if it's hard, even if it costs. God, I want to do what you want me to do. God, speak. Living God, speak into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.